I arrived in Birmingham, Alabama, filled with anticipation drawn by a four-day celebration that blended minor and major league baseball in a heartfelt tribute to the Negro Leagues. On Tuesday, June 18th, my ticket in hand, I made my way to the ballpark, eager to witness history come alive. The Birmingham Barons, dressed in the iconic uniforms of the Black Barons, took the field with pride. Opposing them, the Montgomery Biscuits, honoring their own hometown history, wore the colors of the Gray Sox. This poignant tribute evoked the abdominal spirit of the legendary Negro League teams, whose passion and skill once electrified ballparks across America. The Birmingham Black Barons, a cornerstone of Negro League baseball, began their illustrious journey in 1920. They quickly became a beloved team, often drawing larger crowds than their white counterparts. With luminaries like Satchel Paige, they clinched the 1927 pennant, but fell to the Chicago American Giants in the championship series. Despite never capturing a Negro World Series title, the Black Barons left an indelible mark on the game. Over 26 remarkable years, they claimed three Negro American League titles between 1943 and 1948. Yet the Homestead Grays thwarted their World Series dreams each time. Their early years were particularly challenging as financial hardships from the Great Depression forced the team to sell promising players like Page and Mule Suttles, who would later cement their legacies in the Hall of Fame. Beyond the team, the most iconic symbol of the Black Barons' legacy is Rick Wood Field. Modeled after Ford's Field in Pittsburgh and even used as a stand-in for it in the movie 42, Rickwood Field was the first minor league stadium built from concrete and steel. Opened in 1910, it remained in use for over a century, becoming the last surviving stadium connected to Negro League Baseball after the demolition of old Yankee Stadium in 2008. Despite up and downs, the Black Barons' enduring legacy in baseball includes nurturing a young center fielder named Willie Mays. At just 17, Mays played for the team in the final Negro World Series. His extraordinary talent drawing Major League scouts to Rickwood Field. Like the Black Barons, Mays' legacy would persist, leaving a lasting impact on baseball. During the game, the announcement of the death of the 93-year-old Mays reverberated through the Rickwood PA system. The crowd, momentarily stunned by the news, rose to their feet in a standing ovation. A fitting tribute to a legend whose journey began on that very field. The morning after the game, I found myself drawn to First Avenue, eager to see the mural of Willie Mays set to be unveiled later that day. The towering mural of Mays now stands sentinel, capturing the baseball legend in his prime, resplendent in his original Birmingham Black Barons uniform. This monumental work of art, 50 feet tall, and 150 feet wide was crafted by Philadelphia artist Chuck Stiles. The mural, brought to life by Colossus Media, was completed in conjunction with Rick Woodfield's Negro League celebration. It stands as a permanent fixture, a vibrant tribute to the enduring intersection of culture, sports, and community. This powerful homage to Willie Mays not only honors his legacy, but also serves as a source of inspiration for future generations. It celebrates the spirit of excellence that transcends time and place. As I stood there, the morning sun casting long shadows, I felt a deep connection to the past and an overwhelming sense of hope for the future. This mural, much like Mays himself, would forever be a beacon of resilience and greatness. I then made my way to the Alabama Sports Hall of Fame, an institution brought to life by a state legislative act on August 14, 1967. This hollowed sanctuary transcends the role of a mere museum, standing as a dedicated monument to the illustrious athletic heritage of Alabama. Spanning 33,000 feet, it houses over 5,000 artifacts, each whispering tales of the state's native sons and daughters who reached the pinnacle of greatness in their respective sports, embodying the resilient spirit of the state. Within these walls, 
legends come alive. Jesse Owens, whose unmatched speed defied the odds and shattered records. Hank Aaron, whose steadfast swing carved his name in the annals of baseball history. Joe Lewis, whose powerful fists brought him to the zenith of boxing. Willie Mays, whose elegance on the diamond captivated fans. Nick Saban, whose strategic brilliance forged modern football dynasties. And Paul Bear Bryant, the mastermind behind countless championships. All these titans linger here in spirit, their legacies forever enshrined. The Alabama Sports Hall of Fame with over 300 inductees including five of ESPN's top 15 athletes of the last century, stands as a testament to Alabama's enduring excellence. For those seeking to immerse themselves further in the pantheon of heroes, the museum's official website provides a complete roster of the enshrined, offering a gateway to the rich history and remarkable achievements of Alabama's finest athletes. As I walked through the halls, I could feel the presence of greatness, the echoes of cheers from stadiums past, and the unwavering spirit of athletes who dared to dream and conquer. I had read online reviews of black-owned Eugene's Hot Chicken and thought it sounded like the perfect place to get some lunch. From the outside, Eugene's Hot Chicken presents a modern facade reminiscent of those beloved franchises that have stood the test of time and built a loyal following. Stepping inside, I found the seating a little limited, but the menu was not. I placed my order at one window and picked up my number at the other and then went outside to sit under the covered patio to wait for them to bring me my food. The staff who took my order was friendly and professional while the waitress who brought me my food was exceptionally nice. I opted for the mild chicken tenders and waffles, and they were plated beautifully. With the waffles on one side and the tenders on the other, it looked almost too good to eat. The tenders tasted homemade, carrying a gentle kick of spice. So if you're feeling daring, be prepared for a real challenge with the hotter varieties. The waffles were just right, crunchy on the outside, spongy on the inside, exactly how they should be. The chicken came straight from the fryer, piping hot and delicious. When it comes to value for money, Eugene stands out. For $14.50, you get chicken tenders and waffles, which are significantly larger than those from Raising Cane's three-piece combo or Popeye's handcrafted tender dinners. The waffle is made in-house, adding to the uniqueness of the meal. Personally, I felt that I got my money's worth. The combination of quality, quantity, and the care put into each plate makes Eugene's a must visit for anyone looking to experience some of the best hot chicken around. As I left, I knew I had found a new favorite, a place where the food's heat is matched only by the warmth of the service. Clay Cornelius is the dynamic force behind Red Clay Tours, a company dedicated to providing the ultimate Birmingham experience. Red Clay Tours offers a wide variety of engaging experiences, including the Civil Rights Tour, Meet the Magic City, Best of Birmingham Food and Drink, and a Birmingham Brewery Tour. I chose to dive deep with the Fight for Your Rights Tour, and it was nothing short of extraordinary. The tour felt like stepping into a time machine, allowing us to see Birmingham through the eyes of someone intimately familiar with its hidden stories and its historical significance. I stood on the front steps of the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, ready to meet Clay. This wasn't part of my original tour, and I certainly didn't have the time to visit it properly, but let me tell you, this place is an absolute must-see. The Institute offers an immersive one to two hour deep dive into Birmingham's intense civil rights history. It's not just about reflecting on the past, it's about understanding the ongoing global struggle for human rights, which is profoundly moving. The exhibits are meticulously detailed, covering some of the city's most significant and horroring events, 
including the devastating bombing at the 16th Street Baptist Church by the Ku Klux Klan. Every corner of the Institute resonates with the stories of courage and resilience that have shaped our world. Seriously, if you're in Birmingham, you owe it to yourself to experience this powerful testament to the fight for justice and equality. Close by the entrance to the Institute stood a statue of Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, a man of unyielding resolve during the 1963 Birmingham Civil Rights Campaign. As a co-founder of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, he held a crucial position within the movement. Fred and Martin Luther King Jr. often differed in their approaches to fighting for civil rights. Their strategies sometimes clashed, yet Fred's role remained indispensable, his actions pivotal to the cause. In 1961, the Reverend Shuttleworth moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, where he took up the mantle of pastor. But his mission extended far beyond the pulpit. He relentlessly combated racism, championed the rights of the homeless, and fought for justice on all fronts. Fred was not just a preacher, he was a warrior for equality. Even after retiring in 2007, the Reverend did not seek rest. He returned to Birmingham, his legacy a testament to tireless dedication and unwavering effort. Shuttleworth's life was a beacon of hope and change, his contributions making the world a better place for generations to come. The statue near the Institute's entrance serves as a perpetual reminder of his relentless fight for justice and his enduring impact on the civil rights movement. I joined the group in boarding the red clay bus, and the tour began. As we settled into our seats, Clay Cornelius began recounting the stories of courage and sacrifice that defined Birmingham's role in the Civil Rights Movement. In 1963, the Birmingham Children's Crusade was a testament to the resolve and bravery of the young. James Bevel, a charismatic leader with a vision for change, spearheaded this audacious movement. Fifty students at a time emerged from the 16th Street Baptist Church, their hearts set on marching to hear Birmingham City Hall to confront Mayor Art Haynes about the city's oppressive segregation laws. Nearly a thousand were arrested on that first day, their spirits undaunted. The very next day, a fresh wave of students continued the march. Undeterred by the previous day's arrest, they strode towards City Hall with determination. Eugene Bull Connor, the notorious city commissioner of public safety, responded with unyielding cruelty. He unleashed German shepherds and directed high-pressure fire hoses on the children, their innocent bodies thrown by the force of the water, their cries piercing the air. The national and international media captured these horroring scenes. Photographs of children being attacked by dogs and knocked down by water jets shocked the conscience of the world. These images, seared into the minds of many, fueled public outrage against Birmingham and its officials. The brutality inflicted upon these young crusaders ignited a global call for justice, highlighting the monstrous face of segregation and galvanizing support for the civil rights movement. Through the lens of these young heroes, the world saw the undeniable truth. The fight for equality was not just a struggle for the present, but a hope for the future. The Birmingham Children's Crusade became a pivotal chapter in the American civil rights story, a powerful testament to the strength and spirit of youth, standing firm against the tide of injustice. In 1938, as the nation grappled with the lingering effects of the Great Depression, a diverse assembly of black and white Southerners convened at the Municipal Auditorium. Their mission was to advocate for economic reforms under the banner of industrial democracy. Their vision was bold and inclusive, aiming for a better life for all, irrespective of race or gender. The gathering was a mosaic of influential figures. Governors, congressmen, bankers, and industrialists mingled with academics, labor leaders, and social reformers. Presiding over the historic meeting was Senator John H. Bankhead, 
Among the notable speakers was Charles S. Johnson from Fisk University and Donald Comer of Avondale Mills. In the audience, keenly observing the proceedings, were Senator Claude Pepper, Justice Hugo Black, and the esteemed educator Mary McLeod Bethune. However, not everyone shared the enthusiasm for change. Police Commissioner Bull Connor, notorious for his staunch opposition to integration, attempted to segregate the audience with a rope. In a powerful act of defiance, Eleanor Roosevelt moved her chair to the middle of the aisle, symbolizing her unwavering support for unity and progress. Inside, 5,000 people filled the auditorium, while another 2,000 stood outside, all united in their hope for a better future. A decade later, in 1948, the Democratic National Convention convened in Philadelphia from July 12th to July 15th. The convention nominated President Harry S. Truman. On July 14th, a fervent push for civil rights was led by Northern Democrats, spearheaded by Hubert Humphrey. In a dramatic protest, 35 Southern delegates, including those from Alabama and Mississippi, walked out. They reconvened at the Municipal Auditorium where the Dixiecrats nominated Strom Thurmond as their candidate for president. This defiant assembly drew a crowd of 6,000, a stark reminder of the deep-seated divisions within the nation. Birmingham bore the scars of tension and violence, a city deeply entrenched in segregation. Any steps toward integration was met with fierce and often brutal resistance. Martin Luther King Jr. aptly described it as probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Bull Connor, the Commissioner of Public Safety, enforced this segregation with an iron fist, employing tactics that were as ruthless as they were effective. Bombings frequently tore through black homes and institutions, with at least 21 bombings of black properties and churches in the eight years preceding 1963. In the 1940s, Center Street delineated Birmingham's color line. The west side remained predominantly white, while the east side saw significant demographic shifts. The street earned the grim moniker Dynamite Hill, a testament to the city's notorious reputation as Bombingham. Born from over 40 bombings that rocked Birmingham between the late 1940s and mid-1960s, these bombings, which totaled around 40, remain unsolved to this day. In 1950, a black family, the Monks, dared to cross the color line by purchasing a house on the white side of Center Street in Birmingham, challenging the city's zoning laws. On December 21, 1950, the Klan responded with characteristic violence, bombing the home at 950 North Center Street in a futile attempt to maintain the racial divide. On March 25, 1965, in a calculated act of terror, a bomb was discovered before it could detonate at this Catholic church, timed precisely with the commencement of the march to Montgomery in Selma, 90 miles away, underscoring the pervasive reach of hatred and the extreme measures taken to maintain the oppressive status quo. Perched near the peak of Dynamite Hill, a house stands, surrounded by a tall, vine-covered brick wall. This wall, erected to deflect bullets and bombs, has withstood numerous attacks over the years. Martin Luther King Jr. often visited this home, which remains intact and unaltered. The owner refuses to tear down the wall, viewing it as a testament to resilience and an unwavering refusal to succumb to violence and terrorism. The wall stands as a silent sentinel, bearing witness to a history of struggle and the enduring spirit of those who refuse to be broken. From 1956 to 1961, Bethel Baptist Church became the pulsing heart of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights, guided by the indomitable Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth. Within its sacred walls, 
a congregation rose to challenge the brutal chains of segregation, employing the tools of legal action and nonviolent protests to confront the pervasive injustices of their everyday lives. In 1961, their courageous endeavors during the Freedom Rides demanded the attention of the nation, ultimately compelling federal enforcement of desegregation laws. Across the street, the parsonage and guardhouse bore silent witness to the relentless struggle, their steadfast presence a testament to the unwavering resolve of those within. The church endured the violent attempts to silence its mission, bombed three times by the forces of hate. On Christmas Day in 1956, again in June 1958, and lastly in December 1962. Each time the church stood resilient, a steadfast symbol of a fight that would not be easily broken. Its walls scarred yet unyielding, echoing the resolve of a community that would not bow, embodying the enduring spirit of a people determined to carve out their place in the pages of history. In 1954, amidst the throes of the Jim Crow South, a man named A.G. Gaston erected a sanctuary in Birmingham christened the A.G. Gaston Motel. This establishment, a beacon of refuge and dignity for African American travelers, found its place in the Negro Motorist Green Book, guiding weary souls to a haven of safety and respect. By 1963, the motel had become more than just a respite from the road. Room 30 transformed into the strategic heart of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. It was here that giants of the Civil Rights Movement, Martin Luther King Jr., Ralph Abernathy, and Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth gathered in solemn resolve. Within these walls, they conceived their plans, marshaled their strength, and stoked the fires of justice. On May 10th, 1963, the cruel hand of white supremacy struck a violent blow. Bombs shattered the peace of the motel, a heinous act meant to quell the rising tide of change. Yet the building endured a steadfast witness to both the courage of its defenders and the fierce hatred they faced. Kelly Ingram Park transformed into a crucible of the civil rights movement during the turbulent 1960s. In May 1963, the Reverend James Bevel spearheaded the student protest within the boundaries of this park. It was here that children and high school students embodying the spirit of the resistance confronted the brutal forces of Birmingham's police and fire departments under the ruthless direction of Bull Connor. These young protesters were met with a barrage of arrests, snarling dogs, and the unyielding forces of fire hose. As the world watched these horroring scenes unfold, outrage swelled across the globe. The images of innocent, courageous youth standing their ground against such relentless hostility galvanized public opinion and pressured Birmingham leaders to concede. The city's promise to dismantle public segregation was a significant victory, a beacon of hope emerging from the heart of a battleground. The 16th Street Baptist Church stands not just as a place of worship, but as a battlefield in the civil rights movement. On the fateful morning of September 15, 1963, the Ku Klux Klan unleashed their hatred in the form of a bomb, shattering the sanctuary of this sacred place. The explosions claimed the lives of four innocent young girls and left 22 others wounded, a tragic climax to what was supposed to be a joyous youth day. As the city mourned, over 8,000 people gathered to pay their respect, their sorrow a testament to the profound loss yet conspicuously absent were the city officials, a silence that spoke volumes. The bombing was not an isolated incident, but part of a larger, relentless assault on the quest for equality. It became a catalyst, forcing the federal government to act. The reverberations of this tragedy echoed through the halls of power, contributing to the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 monumental strides toward justice and equality. The resilience of the church and its community was unyielding, with over $300,000 raised for repairs. The 16th Street Baptist Church reopened its doors on June 7, 1964. 
Among the repairs, a point in addition came from across the Atlantic, a stained glass window depicting a black Jesus, gifted by the people of Wales. This symbol of solidarity and hope now stands as a reminder of the global support for the struggle against racial injustice. The story of the 16th Street Baptist Church is one of tragedy and triumph, a testament to the enduring spirit of a community and a movement determined to see justice prevail. The scars of that day remain, but so does the resolve to never forget and to continue the fight for a better, more just world. As Clay brought us back to our starting point, his final words, a powerful quote from Coretta Scott King, lingered in the air and in my memory. Struggle is a never-ending process. Freedom is never really won. You have to earn it and win it in every generation. Come on. The last stop before heading back to New Orleans was at the Negro Southern League Museum. Located in Birmingham's Parkside District, where the echoes of past triumphs blend seamlessly with the present. The museum stands as a tribute to the Birmingham Black Barons and the league that was their stage. In August of 2015, beneath a sky tinged with the hues of memory and ambition, the museum opened its doors, proclaiming itself the largest sanctuary dedicated to African American sports in the United States. From the Roaring Twenties through the transformative 1960s, the Negro Southern League was a corridor of opportunity, a stepping stone to the grander arena of the national pastime. Birmingham and Montgomery, with their pioneering teams, the Birmingham Black Barons and the Montgomery Gray Sox, became the cradles of legends. It was here that Willie Mays and Satchel Paige, those future titans of the sport, first dazzled the crowds with their power setting the stage for their eventual enshrinement in the Baseball Hall of Fame. The museum itself is the brainchild of Leighton Ravel, a passionate baseball researcher whose vision gave birth to the Center for Negro Baseball League Research. Construction began in June 2014, fueled by a $3.6 million investment from the city, a testament to Birmingham's commitment to preserving this rich heritage. Within its walls, the museum narrates the tale of the league and the African-American athletes of Alabama who continue to shape baseball long after the color barriers fell. The Negro Southern League Museum is not merely a repository of artifacts, but a living chronicle of dreams and achievements, a place where the past and present converge in a timeless dance, celebrating the indomitable spirit of those who paved the way for future generations. I've never felt the need to do this before, but for this episode, I felt compelled to share my experiences. I don't want to leave you with the wrong impression of Birmingham, Alabama. I want you to visit Birmingham for yourself. It's not what you expect. It's a warm, friendly city filled with wonderful people, both white and black. I had come for a celebration, and Birmingham put on its best for us visitors, which I truly appreciate. Yes, the city has its problems, but all cities do. There are a lot of amazing things to see and do in Alabama, like the Birmingham Zoo, the Alabama Sports Hall of Fame, the Museum of Art, and the Negro Southern League Museum. There are also many first-rate restaurants to choose from. You can even experience the struggle for civil rights in Birmingham firsthand by visiting the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, the 16th Street Baptist Church, Kelly Ingram Park, and many more. Knowing that to fully appreciate the celebration of the Negro Leagues at Rickwood Field, I needed to understand what life was like here during the dark days of the 1950s and 1960s. I took a tour led by Clay Cornelius of Red Clay Tours who knew the history backwards and forwards. So please come to Birmingham. You will thoroughly enjoy yourself. But if you want to understand the true face of our shared history, take a tour led by a knowledgeable local like Clay. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe, like, share, comment, do all the YouTube stuff. And remember, it's not goodbye. It's see you next Tuesday on Gulf Coastal Connection. Hey, yo! oh.